Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Yes, hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Alderson, and today uh, some very interesting uh, history of a very dark time um, in the in the past. Uh, I've got Professor James Belich here. He's the Bite Professor of Imperial and Commonwealth History at uh, Balliol College at Oxford. Uh, and uh, James, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Tyler. We're here to talk about the Black Death, which was um, really about as uh, about as harrowing as the name makes it sound. Uh, and uh, uh, James, you're the author of The World the Plague Made, The Black Death, and The Rise of Europe. And before, before we get into all of the specifics, I, I did want to ask, the, the Black Death is known as this real specter in history. Um, and uh, before we get into the specifics, it's the 14th century. It's a big plague um, uh, caused by the bubonic plague. Is it just the scale, the staggering scale of this plague that has has made it so renowned as, you know, even again, the name the Black Death just just is is such um, a huge uh, part of our history? Yes, it is. Uh, it's almost too big to accommodate. Um, it's it's a it, it's a disaster that that defies imagination. Uh, where essentially the the best evidence is that half the people that are hit by the first strike around 1350 die, uh, and that's just a staggering death rate. That's given the, given that it's. Um, percolated through most of West Eurasia, Europe and the Middle East and North Africa, and a bit of um, West Central Asia, um, and that it covered such a large area. You're talking about a sort of gigantic shared experience of that's, that's so traumatic that I sometimes wonder whether historians have really known what to do with it. Hmm. Uh, and while I... I, I um, I, I've, I genuinely feel the, the the sort of human trauma that must have been involved. I've tried to kind of set that to one side without entirely forgetting it, and to look at what the implications uh, for social and economic and political history would be of such a devastating reshuffling. <laughs> And this this seems like such a trite question, but I mean it's it's true. We have seen the effects of something, and I, I don't I really don't want to downplay COVID at all because it has been it has been horrible. But it is it's not on the same scale as this. I mean it's 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 we we're talking about you know compared to the certainly the fatality rate of COVID something sort of mind bogglingly more. And so through all the the hardship that we've seen. Um, you know, I guess we're thinking of just multiplying it by by that mind boggling number. Um, I, I assume that um, that has given you a bit of a, um, a a bit of a different perspective on, uh, you know, having lived through, again, a, a pandemic that I, I, um, I don't want to downplay, but, you know, uh, to, you know, gives you a sense of, wow, it, it was this bad for this and what it must have been for this entirely different uh, scale. Yes, it's, um, I started work on this, of course, long before COVID, um, and the rumours of me running around Wuhan in 2019 are totally <laughs> false. Um, it wasn't a publicity stunt. But, uh, and, and during the process of writing, I was a bit reluctant to compare COVID with the Black Death because it seemed disproportionate. They do have one dramatic thing in common, which I think is important, and that is they're a random and unusual accident uh, in, in, in nature, which then goes global because of human connectivity. I mean, neither of them could have happened if they had been, um, if, if their worlds had been unconnected. So you, you've got to have A, the natural accident, and B, the human connectivity, 
which means that these are a kind of joint venture uh, between ecological accident and human history. And that's something the two pandemics do have in common. Hmm. I I love that you talked about the connectivity because as, as as we start getting into kind of the world of the plague, that's something I think that um, would surprise a lot of people um, who think of the past as this kind of dirty provincial, uh, you know, peasants in farms, not not much else going on. This was a highly interconnected Europe and and as you say, North Africa, the Middle East, Asia. This was a highly connected world, an international world that allowed, I mean, among many other things, this this plague to uh, really infiltrate into every you know uh, area and, and, and all parts of society. Can you give a sense of the kind of cultural uh, nexuses and networks? Um, again, we're, you know, I, I think we're sort of centering in many ways around Europe in, in this discussion, but, you know, also connecting Europe to a much, much broader um, area. Right. I mean, it's the intensity of connection that counts uh, with the plague because uh, I believe, as do most scholars these days, that um, it's transferred by rat fleas on black rats. And that's its main form of transfer. Um, It can be transferred human to human direct, but if you catch it that way, you die very quickly and are unlikely to be able to move very far. So rats are the main vectors, and they move basically along with the gra- with the with the grain trade, as uh, as many historians have noted. And you know, all ships carry grain or grain products to feed their crews. Um, you've got a lot of grain carried on river systems and canal systems. You've got large wagons with a, a ton or two of, uh, of grain, and in all those contexts, rats can hide. Then they can also transfer it unassisted by humans, which is simply by spreading, as they normally do, and in interacting with other rat colonies. They, they normally spread to the point where they saturate all available niches, because although they don't move far or fast themselves, they do breed like rats, as I put it in the book. Uh, and so you've got a, a slow form of spread, rats direct, and a faster form of spread, rats hitchhiking on the human grain trade. It's it's an incredible thing to think that you know just the 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 uh, the rat, which you know everyone everyone seems to have, uh, was able to just cause so much destruction. Uh, you mentioned the grain. Um, Again, something that uh, I, I, I find just very interesting, besides the, the, the plague implications um, of all this, what, um, what are these networks carrying? Is it, is it it's really everything that's, that's, um, you know, that's moving around? I, I, again, I, I, I feel like a lot of people in a pop cultural sense have a sense that, well, if you lived in one place, you would get all your food from that place. You'd get every, you know, all your textiles from that place. That really wasn't the case. I mean, these networks were quite extensive. True. Um, the, the people were much more self-sufficient than they are today. That's true. Uh, but urban areas in particular had grown so large uh, that in the context of the time that they couldn't feed themselves from their own immediate hinterlands. So the grain trade was partly, was largely urban, urban oriented. So it's it's boats going from grain surplus areas uh, like the Russian river system, Southern steppes, for example, or from Sicily, uh, which were big grain suppliers um, to cities all around uh, the coasts of Europe and North Africa uh, that do the damage. And then there are a few regions like Norway um, and Iceland where grain is difficult to grow and they tried to import grain as well. But timber shipments could also um, conceal rats and various other things could. Very small scale trade, uh, like pack horses, um, it would be difficult for rats to hitchhike on because for fairly obvious reasons. Um, And whether they're carried by camels is controversial. There's a 
there's another way in which um, camels could transfer plague. It's a, it's a complicated thing we can go into if you wish, but basically um, the, the, the rat is the chief villain. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons plague disappeared, although by no means the only one, was that the black rat, which happens to have a flea, which is the best carrier of um, uh, Yersinia pestis, which is the plague pathogen, um, was eventually wiped out by the rats we're familiar with today, Norway rats, the sort of bigger brown rat. And they don't like black rats, luckily for us. And so in, in a large number of regions, including much of the states, they've kind of eliminated black rats. Um, although there are some niches like Madagascar where black rats still thrive and so does plague. That's uh, that's interesting to think that the uh, the, the one one rat killed everyone and the and the other rat came in and and kind of saved that's right. <laughs> saved you know, us. So there's, so there's two sides <laughs> to the rat. You can't yeah. demonize rats. You know they saved us as well as killed us. Here you go. Um, so when we're talking about something, you know, um, this scale. It it almost feels. I mean, you know, um, it, it it comes across uh, in in the middle of the 14th century, and and it almost feels like it happens all at once. I, I assume that a lot of these, uh, like a lot of things, it's a sort of what's the phrase? It happened very gradually, and then all at once. There's a uh, you know, there's a build up, and then and then an explosion. Um, did anyone at at the time? I guess note <laughs> that there was about to be an explosion, or were there were there warning signs? Were there people worried about that, or did it seem to just kind of fall from the skies, you know, as as this came down? Probably more more fall from the skies. I think um, no one predicted it. Um, once it happened, people remembered portents and meteors and birds falling from the sky um, and so on and wondered how they had annoyed God so much. Um, and so um, it was a huge convulsion. But the surprising thing was the first strike was actually quite quick. Um, we, we think it, 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 it sort of kicks off around um, 1338, makes its way to the Volga region from Kyrgyzstan in, um, in, by about 1345, and then by about 1352, you know, in a little more than five years, it swept the entire region. Um, but what makes it worse is that this was just the first strike. There are another 17 of these things by, um, by the 1520s, and in total, something like 30 of them by the early 18th century. Now, the later strikes were never as lethal or as widespread as the Black Death itself, that first mega strike. Um, but they, they, they maintained the kind of pressures that the Black Death had created, particularly on labor supply, um, which meant that its effects were kind of bedded in over the fairly long term. So it was both a single disastrous event and the first of a long sequence of fairly disastrous events from a human perspective, which kept populations low and meant that available resources were much greater per person than had hitherto been the case. So the essence of the case is that a, a very undercapitalized and impoverished economy, except for the very tiny topmost elite uh, in 1345, um, became a, an, an economy with half as many people, each of whom had, on average, twice as many resources. Not just cash, but higher wages, better peasant tenures, uh, more common land, more livestock, more horses, more fishing spots, more boats, more houses, everything essentially doubled. So you had a sudden recapitalization of what had been a fairly limited uh, socio-economy prior to that. And although uh, not everybody um, benefited equally, uh, there was a, a kind of golden age that emerged for most common folk, not all, uh, which lasted 
from about 1350 to about 1500. And then the tide turned and human populations began to grow again. And although some of the effects of plague remained in place, for example, the desire for exotic goods and for um, uh, unsustainable resources like furs and whales and codfish, uh, un unsustainable uh, exploitation of resources, uh, they stayed in place. And although things for common folk got consistently worse uh, from about 1500, the expansive impulse and the move up in technology towards Chinese levels, though not yet achieving them uh, in, in, in the 15th century, was very substantial. So it really was a game changer uh, for Europe and its neighbours. And my argument is that it actually kicks off this remarkable um, European process of European expansion. Uh, and you're sitting in one of its products in the Americas, and I'm sitting in another one in Australasia at the moment, and I work in yet another one uh, in England. So this process where English history was deeply affected by a kind of colonial ricochet, so um, it was a really world-changing set of events. And I've always been suspicious of the notion that it was somehow European virtues or lucky accidents that created this phenomenon of European expansion. So I've long been looking for a more historical and contingent explanation for what is a remarkable, disastrous for some people's expansion. Uh, that is, you know, European global hegemony. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things. So obviously, that's you know the the uh, the the subtitle of uh, uh, the subtitle of your book talks about the rise of Europe, and it it is a deeply uh, paradoxical concept, isn't it? That that something that was so catastrophic um, to Europe on the one hand. Um, your argument is enabled, you know, uh, some of this kind of change, not just in, in kind of, uh, as you talk about the expansion, but the actual kind of living conditions of the people that survived. How, when you talk about a, um, uh, the society prior to the plague with uh, essentially a very few select haves and, and a, a whole bunch of have-nots, how is it that um, upon, you know, after after the plague, was it just such a shock and then kind of a scramble for resources? And you, you know, if your neighbor died, you got you got their land. And, and if, you know, and you might have gotten their house, um, you know, was it that kind of um, uh, kind of reorganization or were there more um, broad scale political um, reorganizations and, and revolutions following the plague? Uh, well, both is the answer. Um, the, the initial reaction was surprisingly uh, kind of muted in terms of politics. Um, what's really re most remarkable about it is this human resilience. You know, you, you get up and you plant and you sow despite the fact that, um, you know, half your family has died. Um, you don't just seize other people's houses. Um, you acquire them through inheritance. Or if they've got no occupants, you, you, you then might take them over. Uh, lords tried to prevent um, the benefits flowing to common folk, and they tried very hard. They used laws. They used coercion. Um, you know, they had laws against fashion. You know, uh, no, all new fashions are banned as the uh, Venetian Senate said soon after the plague. Um, but none of that worked. And where it looked like working, there was a, a, an intensive uh, up, upsurge in peasant rebellions and urban rebellions, some of which you will have heard of, you know, Watt Tyler and, uh, and the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 and the Jacquerie in France. So, uh, and various others, lots of them in Italy, and someone's counted these and found that the number of, um, of peasant rebellions or urban rebellions increases by a factor of about three after the plague per century. So people are protecting their gains 
They're not scrabbling for gains. They're getting these gains. The lords and the church and the state are trying to increase their share of the gains and people resist it. On the whole, fairly successfully until about 1500 when they lose leverage because the population's increasing and you no longer uh, have the situation where more opportunity and more capital is chasing less labor. So this is what you're talking about is largely a numbers game. It's it's essentially that there that there's more there are, there are the same number of resources, there are fewer people, they are therefore able to exploit those resources and also there are fewer people so any labor that has to be done, they are suddenly more in demand for that labor which kind of causes their quote price for doing that labor to go up that's kind of the basic economic <laughs> concept it's, it's not rocket science that's fairly simple yeah. at that level but what you also get is um, a situation where technological innovation is suddenly incentivized so water milling which has hitherto been used mainly to grind grain now starts being used to help refine metals and to um, beat cloth into cloth fibers together um, and to, um, you know, make paper and to um, do all sorts of things that it hadn't been used for before. Uh, And most notably, you see a huge increase in the availability of metal to people, which changes the nature of warfare, which changes the nature of agriculture. Um, and so there's advances there. Then, uh, so as well as water power, you, you also have the use of wind power, where, you know, windmills might be one obvious thing. You know, the Dutch start using windmills to drain their peat bogs uh, and to power sawmills. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, people start developing a form of sailing ship that hasn't really been seen anywhere before. Uh, which is a a generalist rather than a specialist, whereas sail-only ships had previously been used only in particular seas or seasons, and where you needed to go outside your your comfort zone, you used a ship that also had oars as kind of insurance. So um, you now started to see, because oarsmen were so expensive, 200 oarsmen, you know, carried as insurance in case the wind was against you, uh, was a real problem, you started to develop different kinds of rigging, uh, which enabled you to tack against the wind and to get out of most situations that you're in trouble with. And you could actually track this uh, in clear steps, uh, starting within 50 years of plague and culminating by about sort of 1480 with the emergence of the Karak, three-mastered Karak, and soon after that with the emergence of the Galleon. Uh, now, these these ships could go anywhere, uh, and that was very difficult for ships prior to that, um, for sailing ships. And then on top of that, you had the, the last of the deadly trio, um, which was gunpowder energy, and you'd had gunpowder before the Black Death. But after it, there was a huge boom in the use of gunpowder weapons because it, they saved labour. And they saved labor by being making it much easier to train soldiers. So a, a longbowman or a horseman or even a crossbowman would take years to train. A competent musketeer would take, you know, months. So there's a big incentive to turn to more gunpowder weapons, not because they're necessarily better than the best of bows at the time, uh, but because they require much less training. And so there's this shift in the plagued regions to sailing ships and to more and better gunpowder weapons, which gives teeth to the European desire to expand, to acquire more exotic goods or to acquire more codfish or more whales or more sable furs. So um, that's, that's basically how, how – so the economy bleeds in to the politics and there's also all sorts of cultural dimensions to it uh which you know i haven't been able to go to even in the book despite how long it is you know um the impact of half the population dying 
must have had cultural effects and I myself would tend to link them to not just the Renaissance, uh, but also to the Reformation. So you're really talking about a, a global mover and shaker here. Although the Renaissance and the Reformation are kind of China shops in which even this bull fears to tread. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. And and I, I do want to ask about that. You also mentioned something, though, that I, I really would like to get to. You mentioned gunpowder and um, gunpowder, as I think a lot of people you know, are aware, is not something that necessarily was first uh, synthesized in Europe. Um, and as we've been talking about Europe, um, there's this kind of, you know, there's this sense of, um, you know, the Black Death and the, again, as, as your book is called, the, the rise of Europe. Um, why is it or do we see, I, I shouldn't say, why don't these uh, things happen in, in some of the other regions um, affected by plague, but what um a what do we see the effects of plague being beyond the european world and are, are there any differences as to why uh you know europe in particular or how europe in particular uh, you know reacted to the the plague shocks um compared to say china and other parts of asia or north africa or the middle east as we've discussed well as far as china uh, is concerned and india um, they were the leaders of the global economy, um, both before and after plague, um, essentially because they had this super crop called paddy rice, which could um, feed denser populations and which enabled them to develop super crafts like very fine cotton and silk and porcelain, which the whole world wanted. So the world's merchants went to India and China. Uh, they could globalize by attraction. They didn't need to expand. People came to them bringing what they wanted. They didn't have to go outwards. Although they were fully capable of doing so, they, they didn't normally need to. So um, they're still in the lead. But my argument is, and this is still controversial, I should warn your listeners, <laughs> um, is that the plague, which is generally assumed to have hit China as well in the 14th century, did not. And that by largely through accident, um, which explicable accident, which I try to explain in the book, the, the, the plague emerges in West Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan and the Tian Shan Mountains. Uh, they've traced the genetics back to there. And for accidental reasons, goes left instead of right. <laughs> um, it was harder to go right for various reasons I won't go into. But I would argue that it doesn't get to China in the 14th century nor to India, um, and that therefore we've got a sort of demographic divergence which um, enables West Eurasia, not just Europe, to catch up with, um, to begin catching up with the more sophisticated economies of China and India. Now, it, the, the story is not wholly European because uh, other um Asian empires and North African empires emerge at the same time as the European empires do, and in fact lead the show. The Ottoman Empire is the classic example, you know, which is the most powerful and sophisticated state in Europe, uh, let alone in the in West Eurasia. Um, it's got um, a chunk of Europe five times the size of Britain, and its uh, its army and its bureaucracy are state of the art. Um, so it, it is the leading plague beneficiary after, if that's a strange sounding term, isn't it? But, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good plague manager. It takes advantage of the opportunity. The Ottomans are notoriously good at getting people to work for them and fight for them by hook or by crook. You know, they, they, might, right. they might pay you millions or they might enslave you. Whatever way they can get you. And so they do get uh, these formidable armies and a formidable talent. They're much more meritocratic than European systems. So the Ottomans are the world leaders, and, and there are other Asian empires in the game too. The Mughal Empire, the Safavid Empire in Persia, um, the Omani Empire, which plays a very European-like game, using galleons to develop uh, territories in, in East Africa, uh, and the Moroccan 
effort to conquer sub-Saharan Africa and its gold, uh, which takes place in the 16th century, in a way very similar to Cortes's conquest of Mexico. You know, you could almost take the tale of the Moroccan invasion of Songhai, uh, the, the big empire south of uh, in, the sub-Sahar- in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and, and transpose it onto the story of the conquistadors in Mexico and Peru. So what we've missed is that there's been a, 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 an explosion of non-European colonial expansion at the same time. Now, and Russia's included in it too. Now, what are Russia and, and Portugal and, and um, Safavid Persia have in common around 1350? The Black Death. That's the only thing they've got in common. So you get this general effect, which then for various contingent reasons narrows from the whole of West Eurasia, or at least its fringes, down towards Western Europe and eventually down towards Britain in the 18th century. So the bottles gradually fall off the wall. But the 10 green bottles got stacked up by the Black Death, and it wasn't solely a European phenomenon. Um, Basically, there were just as many uh, Asian and African colonial empires as there were European ones. You you mentioned something as well, and it's something that that, uh, that we are – I think increasingly um, uh, aware of, I mean, you know, American in American history um, uh, and, and I'm sure also, you know, where you're teaching in England, um, uh, you know, a huge amount is the, the truly um, uh, all encompassing effect of uh, enslavement on, you know, economies and on kind of in shaping the world that we have, today and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in sort of creating a lot of the systems that we have today. And, and you also mentioned that, the, and you, you touched on it a little earlier, that, um, you know, besides colonial, the colonialism, that actually some of this, um, the roots of, I guess, um, the, the types of enslavements that we see kind of building, again, like, for example, the Americas that, uh, that, that we are, uh, that I'm in right now, um, also have kind of a kickstart or roots in, um, you know, uh, in the after effects of the Black Death. And I, I'd love you to, to discuss that for a while because we know that slavery itself it, it has been a, a constant in the world and unfortunately still is, and, you know, in some ways. But what are the effects of the Black Death on creating the um, – uh, the 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 kind of perfect breeding ground for this this new form of of, of enslavement and slavery to, to take hold. Yes, that's an interesting one. It is basically slavery is is dying out in Christian Europe um, before the Black Death because wages are so low that um, you know if you if you've got a slave you have to pay for their upkeep during childhood and old age an illness, uh, if, if you've got any kind of humanity at all. Um, and it's cheaper to, to hire people who, um, who you don't have to bother about unless they're actually working for you. So slavery is dying out. Um, then suddenly the Black Death hits, and it has a kind of terrible second life because, of course, the need for labour um, is, is now much greater, and you immediately see a doubling or even tripling of slave prices after the Black Death. You know, the numbers are important because they're sometimes the only trace we have of these things. Um, So you can can actually see that fairly clearly, and you also see it in in terms of legal changes to justify slavery again. Um, There's a hesitation about taking fellow Catholics as slaves, so, but the Christians are perfectly happy, the, the Catholics are perfectly happy to take Orthodox Christians and vice versa. There's a hesitation about taking Sunni Muslims as slaves, but the Sunni are perfectly help, happy to take Shiites as, uh, as, as slaves and vice versa. Uh, so there's a kind of contested, a limited pool, especially in areas that have been ravaged by plague. So you start seeing a European turn towards African slaves, whereas previously they've tended towards Eastern European slaves. Um, and you see the beginning of this terrible... Atlantic slave trade, uh, and you see it as soon as within 70 years of plague, say, 
you, you, you see the Portuguese, well, actually, in the Canary Islands, within 15 years of the Black Death, you see an intensification of slave raids. And these shift to the coast of Africa, uh, by certainly by 1420. And, and the terrible story of the Atlantic slave trade be begins even before the Americas are discovered. So, you know, it's going to be there with or without Columbus, but it wouldn't have had its profound effects in the Americas. Hmm. And these African slaves, who as yet have experienced little in the way of plague, actually do much of the dirty work of European expansion in, um, in, in Africa. So you have this extraordinary phenomenon where um, confiscated Native American land is being exploited with stolen African labor to grow uh, Asian crops like sugar or cotton. Uh, well, there was an American variety of cotton too, but say sugar for the benefit of Europe. So it's, it's a global reshuffling of the factors of production. You've got the land from one place, the labor from another continent, the product from another, and the profits go to a fourth. So um, even without much in the way of uh, empire in the Americas, before 1800, you know, most indig indigenous Americans remain independent uh, at that time, um, you have a tremendous exploitation of American resources, uh, not just by plantations, but also through hunting of things like codfish and beaver. Um, and as well, you've got massive extraction of bullion from the silver mines of Potosi and so on, all of which pours first into the European economy, and then a lot of it goes to China to pay for porcelain and, and silk. So it's, it's the, the effects are global, and um, on the whole, they benefit uh, West Eurasia, the whole of West Eurasia at first, but then they begin to more selectively benefit parts of Europe, which get closer and closer to China in terms of power uh, as well as wealth. Uh, the Chinese, they have guns too, they have sailing ships too, but they haven't been through this plague forging, which kind of sharpens them and improves them. And the Chinese are very ready to acknowledge this. I mean, they say that when, when Europeans arrive in the 16th century, as early as 1511, you've got plenty of Chinese accounts saying that the European cannon are better and the European ships are better. We need to emulate them. And they do, they emulate them and then they match them for a while, but then the Europeans cease to be a threat and China relaxes. Meanwhile, back in Europe, the contest is going on. And if, if no dramatic improvements after 1500, between 1500 and 1800, there's surprising little technical improvement in, um, in European ships or, or guns. Um, nevertheless, they're kept up to speed by interstate rivalry in Europe, whereas the Chinese are mostly more worried about steppe nomads, uh, you know, Jurchen and Mongols and Manchu than, than about Europeans. Uh, so Europeans are useful. They're, they're, they're useful traders. They're bringing all sorts of products to China and, um, and they're also paying bullion when, when the Chinese don't want a particular product. So um, they're, they're, they're a nice little trading network to add to your others. So the Chinese welcome, and the Indians welcome their European trading networks that's no problem. Uh, but what it means is if you get other people to do the dirty work of bringing you what you want from the world, they get better at it and you don't. Is is that because I was going to ask, I mean, is that you, you talk about the narrowing of the um, of the effects? And I mean, even when uh, you mentioned things like Oman and, and other uh, colonial enterprises, uh, Morocco in uh, in West Eurasia and Northern Africa and that that sort of sphere, um, we do see this narrowing um, to not not just Europe, not even just Western Europe, but but specific countries. I mean, uh, England and to, you know, Portugal and to Spain, who 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 really push out these colonial um, enterprises and and become heavily involved in the slave trade is um, how is it that that those effects narrow from um, uh, from a, a plague that really affected seemingly everyone of every stripe, you know, across a, a wide, wide geographic swath. 
Um, well, it, it's a it's a contingent story. It depends sort of when and who you're talking. But one of the key things is that um, the the British become particularly good at sort of partial takeovers of other empires. So um, essentially in the 18th century, they take over the Portuguese empire. And, you know, the, 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 the gold from, from Brazil, most of it finds its way to London. And, you know, the, the, the supply and the profitable trades of uh, Portuguese colonies tend to be taken over by the British. To some extent, the same is true of the Dutch Empire and even the Spanish Empire. And they also take over a chunk of the Mughal Empire in the form of Bengal in the 18th century. So they're a kind of, um, what's the term, a hostile takeover expert who, um, you know, they, 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 they kind of snap up the most profitable bits of other people's empires. So you've actually still got the remains of the Mughal, Portuguese, Spanish empires still operating, but under a partial takeover by the British because the British have have developed uh, a sort of global precedence in maritime power, and not necessarily total hegemony, but during the 18th century, they, they do become the last man standing in terms of um, naval power. And that enables them to take greater advantage of the global inputs that have been created by the wider expansion, the earlier wider expansion. So they can range about um, picking the low-lying fruit and adopting global best practice. Uh, and they, they certainly do so in the process of transferring the characteristics of Bengal, which is the world's leading cotton exporter at the beginning of the 18th century, to Lancashire, which is the world's leading cotton exporter by the end of the 18th century. So um, it's a kind of, um, you know, I, I think there's a strong connection between this kind of new this new momentum, uh, which the Ottomans are the early leaders in and the British are the late leaders in, um, to segues into industrialization in Britain um, from about the mid-18th century. So, uh, I mean, you know, people think, well, Jesus, uh, uh, attributing industrialization in Britain in the mid-18th century to a plague that happened four centuries earlier, was it three, four, five? Uh, you know, in the mid 14th century, that's drawing a long bow. But the, the four cornerstones of, of Britain's rise are acknowledged to be its maritime power, its manufactured exports, uh, its the, the immense growth of London. Uh, and I've forgotten what the fourth one is. <laughs> but, um, but those all emerge immediately after plague, you know, and they can be traced to it. But those are the cornerstones of Britain's rise uh, are clearly emergent and can be demonstrated to be so within 100 years of the Black Death and not before. So I, I've got to ask you this, and I, I'm, I'm not I'm not, uh, you know, don't don't take it as a, as a, as a skepticism, uh, you know, based on simply, you know, contrarianism. Um, I, I'm, I'm genuinely I'm wondering um, uh, there are a lot of books out there that essentially pur purport to explain the world through the lens of something or other. Um, I've, I've seen one that talks about cod, um, you know, and, and, you know, or one that talks about salt and how everything can be traced to salt or, um, you know, there's the, there's the classic uh, guns, germs and steel, which is much discussed and debated and you know uh, uh, all that you know around and i'm wondering as as you're doing this research this is a bit of a meta question but how how do you avoid um s you know seeing what you want to see or seeing you know seeing the effects of the plague and everything as you say oh you know 400 years down the line you know but you can but you can trace it back and uh, again i'm not I'm not saying that you can't. I'm just wondering how, you know, do you keep that sort of skeptical mind while you're doing your research and how, how much of it, um, I guess, you know, do you feel like you can narrow down or how much of, you know, history in general, can you narrow down to such, such kind of singular shocks, even one as large as, as the black death? 
I, I, that's a very, um, what we call a good question, which means a very, <laughs> very hard question. Um, and, and, and it sort of hits a nerve, you know, inevitably when you're a revisionist, I suppose the blinkers go on um, and, and you are pursuing, you know, your cause and there's plenty of room for subconscious selectivity. I always try to determine the questions, but not the answers. And mm. quite a number of my theories about plague effects have not, have not panned out. So I say so, or I don't include them. Not everything was caused by the Black Death. Um, even I acknowledge that. But, uh, in, and, and I, I, like you, am a bit sceptical about, you know, how the Basques made the modern world and how the Scots made the modern world and how cod made the modern world and how salt made the modern world, how cotton made the modern world and so on and so on and so on. <laughs> um, but there's a big difference between these things and the Black Death. The Black Death kills half of a vast population over a vast range of the Earth's surface, half. It doubles the per capita availability of everything. If there is one case of a single variable being determinative in global history, this is a pretty strong candidate. You know, it's not cod, it's not salt, it's not just the Scots, <laughs> it's not just the Basque. It's half of everybody and a doubling of everything. So if there is ever a single factor determinant in history, this is it. I'm not saying it's common, um, but I think that it's the profundity of its effects have been underestimated almost um, almost, almost for psychological reasons because it, it spoils too many cherished causal sequences and cuts too many Gordian knots for historians to be happy with a single sort of silver bullet solution to a number of problems. So I think the, the, um, the fear of single factor determinism, which you know what I mean there, is, um, is generally legitimate, but probably overstated on this one. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, bit, a bit like writing a history of 20th century Hiroshima without reference to the bomb to leave out the Black Death. I mean, that's the order of significance. In the urban history of Hiroshima, um, the, the, you, you can't get away from the bomb in the 20th century. Uh, the same with the, the history of late medieval, early modern Europe. You can't get away from the Black Death. So it's, again, we get sort of get back to that. That sense of scale is just, it's, it's really difficult, I think, if, no matter how many catastrophes and, and, and natural disasters and famines and, and wars that, that we see in history, it's, it's really hard to hit this scale. And I'm wondering, again, thinking back to those horrors and, and you know, in, in the past, say, 100 years in living, you know, what we can call living memory, um, there have been plenty of those horrors, those catastrophes, pandemics and wars and all that. And there is a massive psychological toll that they have taken. We, we touched a little bit on that um, uh, it, it, before, but I was wondering, we've talked a lot about numbers and we've talked a lot about sort of forces and, and people and, you know, people as a, as a part of the labor market and that and that kind of thing. Is it difficult when you're doing this kind of research um, either to do it because of that, just that horror, the, you know, the, the, the actual horror of, of the scale um, and, and also sometimes to, to take a step back from the statistics and view it f with that sense of, of deeply personal and deeply human horror. And I know that you've, you know, you, you've, have struggled uh you know you've you've written about you know trying not to be inhumane in the way that you you know discuss uh the the black death uh it is it is a struggle there is a traumatic element um and uh you know i i i attempt with uh with whatever success is for readers to judge to lighten the situation a bit with a bit of humor um 
and and you know it works for me even if it doesn't work for the reader um, <laughs> um so there's that but i think one also does through the numbers and through the broad picture get to a human side that is not particularly easily accessible for example, um, you might recall one of the forms of expansive labour that the play kicks off is what I call, call crew culture. And in Europe, you get these regions that um, they, they stop growing grain themselves because um, the, the, the region that grows it much better down the road has now got a surplus because it's got fewer people. You import your grain and you turn to other kind, kinds of economic activity typically small scale herding, uh, the shift from corn to horn is quite well known in the economic history. And these activities, whereas you need men for the harvest and for the hard work of, of arable grain farming, you don't really need them for, um, for, for dairy industries or wool industries uh, as much. So you get these regions where men are surplus to requirements. And they go and seek work at first seasonally in other regions. They then start um, going longer range and staying away for years on end. And the, I call these crewmen. And they end up being um, the sailors, the whalers, the soldiers, the conquistadors, the fur trappers, the motley crews, the pirates, the smugglers, that are actually the cutting edge of European expansion who go over in numbers similar to that of Africans going across the Atlantic, millions over, over three centuries, and provide the kind of uh, violent, brutal, rough cutting edge of European expansion, doing a lot, most of the killing. Um, and they are kind of produced by these crew regions. Now, back home in these crew regions, the mirror image is that it, they tend to be woman-led. Uh, because the men are constantly overseas, the, uh, the status of women as heads of household, heads of businesses, uh, is considerably enhanced in the crew regions. And so you get a kind of folk feminism in these crew regions, which you can identify. One of the ways you identify them is if you go into a cemetery and you can still read the names and the dates, you'll find that that, only half as many men as should be there are there because the rest died overseas. Hmm. So there's a human dimension that wouldn't be available if you didn't start taking plague seriously as a causal variable in social and cultural history, as well as in global and economic and kind of, um, you know, econometric metric history. Um, so I think that, Although it's quite hard to put faces on particular individuals, you can put faces on this sort of hitherto underexplored dimension of social history, which consists of significant numbers of men and women who, um, whose lives uh, over centuries are uh, affected by the Black Death and who establish this kind of culture of mobility in these crew regions. Men, stay at, men who stay at home are, are, are looked upon with contempt. And you, you, you probably know some yourself. I mean, eventually Nantucket becomes one for whaling. Um, but um, you're talking about upland Scotland. You're talking about Cornwall. You're talking about parts of Ireland. You're talking about Brittany. You're talking about northern Spain, not just the Basque, Basque country, but also Galicia. Uh, you're talking about northern Portugal. And an, a big internal one is Switzerland, where the Swiss send out 1.2 million soldiers between 1400 and 1800 and only uh, 400,000 of them come back. Um, but most of those don't go overseas, whereas the ones on the maritime regions, they do. And Russia has these crew regions too, around Novgorod and, of course, the Cossack region. Uh, and it's these particular areas that supply these um, rough-and-ready crewmen um, that actually do the dirty work of European expansion. <laughs> So, so you've got me convinced of, of a lot of this, and I, 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 I want to know. Well, that's uh, one person, Tyler. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got one person, and and to be quite honest, you know, I'm 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 not really the person that you need to convince in many ways. Um, you know, because I, I, I I'm wondering. I mean, this is, it's it's not like the Black Death hasn't 
been studied before and it's not like you know there's a there's a dearth of uh you know uh medieval and and modern european historians out there um I, i'm wondering how you've mentioned that y- some of the things that you have brought up have been controversial or have, you know, have have gotten some pushback in an area so um, so prominent and, you know, that 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 is such a, a big part of European history. Um, how do you go into that? I mean, you you talked about yourself as a bull in a china shop. Is is that your uh, is, is that your your strategy is just to go in and and, uh, you know, present what you what you will and you know come what may or um (laughs) how Um, how how has your strategy been for presenting your your say more controversial findings (laughs) i guess it is a bit bullish um but but um it's also a, a form of intensive global history that tries to utilize uh comparison and uh formulates a hypothesis but also tries to test it, uh, and in most of the most of the book consists of me testing the th- the theory I've been talking about or the theories uh, on particular cases. And you know, if they don't work, I say so. Uh, but usually they do work. Um, so having the hypothesis is one thing; testing it is another. And if I look at the at the histories of, I guess, a dozen countries. Um, and and how they respond to the Black Death, and there are clear commonalities, and the study of the one enhances the study of the others. So, though I might not have the the depth of specialists, I've got greater breadth. Uh, you know, I'm 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 using Spain to help me understand the Ottoman Empire, and vice versa, uh, and I'm using Genoa to help me understand London and vice versa. So um, that actually helps when they do have an interactive experience and they do have a sort of common atom bomb uh, at the at, at a certain point of their histories. Uh, it, it sort of occurred to me as, as we're talking about this, you know, that, that um, we are, we are two people who are both, a few thousand miles away from Europe. Um, a, a few is actually understating it on your on your case, um, um, and and yet we are talking about something that happened. Uh, you know, we're sitting here today talking about something that happened in Europe. You know, seven hundred years ago, which which goes to show, I uh, you know, just just you know, bre- uh, the kind of breadth alone of the the. Um, the influence that that uh, that that has had, um, and I, I you've mentioned this a couple times. I, I, I'd uh, I'd love to to know because this is something that I think a lot of historians have been reckoning with recently. You've talked about these kind of these old myths, and the idea of Europe as somehow more virtuous, or somehow more industrious, or somehow more put in whatever you know whatever you want to put in there, being the reason for dominance, being the reason that you know. Myself, as you know, of of uh, most you know, a majority European, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, heritage, and and uh, you know, I I don't know your uh, you know your your heritage as well, but I'm I'm guessing likely also you know similar um, are, are living in a you know very very far from the kind of European homeland, and mm-hmm. and even a milieu really you know a political situation really created in many ways by Europe. Um, how how have you approached those specific ideas that are you know in in pop culture and and why is it so important to to move away from that idea that you know oh well Europe is just kind of better and that's why it's ended up quote on top. Hmm. Well, it's certainly bigger. I mean, that's why you and I are communicating in English. <laughs> um, you know, which is right. I mean, we wouldn't have been doing this had it not been for for British expansion. Um, my heritage is Croatian, by the way. Um, you can probably tell the, the Balkan side comes through. Um, but no, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not necessarily contending that there aren't very special things about Europe's past. Um, I'm not suggesting that 
that ancient Greek civilization, for example, might not be just fantastic. It, it, it is just fantastic. You can't look at it. It's something like um, the the Parthenon uh, frees the Elgin marbles uh, without realizing that Athens was something very special. Um, but to draw, to to connect that to to European expansion and European industrialization just can't it can't be assumed. You've got to demonstrate how we got there, and there are various attitudes that uh, various arguments that do this, but many of them still tend to to be suspiciously flattering towards Europe. You know, they, they tend to be virtues rather than vices. It's not because Europeans were vampires or the most bloodthirsty beasts on earth. It's not because we were werewolves. Um, that we succeeded is because we were virtuous. Um, now, that's any successful civilization is going to prefer to attribute its success to its virtues rather than its vices or to mere accident. And we are still in the phase where we are doing that. We are not fully historicizing our own history. History doesn't do favorites, you know. And um, there has to be some reason why it was this tiny wee continent called Europe that managed to spread itself over the whole globe for, for better and for worse. And to not actually try to determine that impartially without, without um, attributing praise or blame, um, you, you, you dehistoricize the problem and you deprive Europeans of their history and neo-Europeans of their history and you deprive the people that resisted them or competed with them or fought against them of uh, the full dimensions of what they were combating. You know, um, th these people that, that um, were against European empire and there were many of them um, had a major thing to contend with and to diminish the uh, scale of, of European expansion is, is not in their interests. Um, but to explain European success in terms of their virtues is ultimately not in European interests either, you know, because we are, we are consenting to collective hagiography rather than attempting a kind of clear-eyed biography. Uh, and and other other civilizations do that too. You know, the Chinese talk talk themselves about you know the uh, as the greatest thing on earth. You know, Chinese historians do this. Um, Islamic historians did it too. Ancient Greek historians did it as well. Um, so there's nothing particularly culpable. It just happens to be that a consequence of Europe's cultural success and cultural imperialism, internal as well as external, happens to be that it becomes the orthodoxy today. Uh, and, you know, to, the, the, the proper task of the historian, I think, is to question uh, that orthodoxy and to offer alternatives to it um, that, aren't, that don't stretch credulity quite as much as the notion that um, for some reason European institutions are better than everybody else's or for some reason Christianity is a more dynamic religion than every other religion or for some reason... Uh, Europeans are more individualist or curiosity driven. I mean, where's the proof of all these things? How did they emerge? What did they stem from? Where are their historical explanations? Um, you know, so uh, I, I think it's just a matter of, of, of being honest and being questioning about the history we have received. Something has to have caused this explosion of Europe, which has done which has changed the world so much for good, for, for good or for ill. Uh, something must have caused it. And I'm providing a, an historical hypothesis that it was this particular demographic convulsion in West Eurasian history. Well, that's as as good a uh, as good a selling point as any, um, and a good as good a stopping point as any uh, for this discussion. I mean, I, I I honestly could go on a lot lot longer um, about this, but really, what I should just be saying is everybody uh, should go out um, and uh, grab the world the plague made the Black Death 
and the Rise of Europe. Uh, the uh, author, uh, James Belich, uh, thank you so much for coming on and discussing just absolutely fascinating history. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you for listening to the Ask Historians podcast. We will see you in a few weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.